Scaling monorepos, and I'm very curious. I know it's a huge room. Who's in a monorepo right now? Who's like company is like okay? So some good. So so there's there's an interesting dichotomy between monorepos and multi-repos, and we'll we'll talk about that. It's good to know there's already some here that are using them. This is me. You can actually NPX jCreamer898. That is a real thing. Uh, it's called Create My Card. It's Tierney from Microsoft Create. It's pretty sweet. Uh, so my name is Jonathan Creamer. I'm a senior engineer at Microsoft. You can basically find me on all the things at jcreamer898. Uh, I blog at jonathancreamer.com. And again, that's that cool NPX Twitter card thing. We love Disney. We're a huge Disney family. We grew up uh, down there. And uh, so we just this was actually just a few weeks ago we got to go. So um, really excited to be here. Last time I was at Connect Tech was I think like two years ago. Uh, it's one of my favorite conferences, and I just can't say enough good things about Pratik and Vincent and the fact that they were able to put this on again for us. So let's continue to give them fist bumps and say thanks to them because this has been awesome. Uh, and keep coming back to Connect Tech. I think honestly I've spoken at a lot of conferences, and I think these guys are really some of the best in the business at it. All right, let's go ahead and dive in. So today we're going to talk about monorepos and uh, and how to scale them. But first of all, I want to get into why. Why would you want to do such a thing as this to create this big monolith of a thing? But that's one thing I want to clarify with people, and, uh, and I wrote a big blog about it, is that like monorepos are not monoliths. And I think a lot of people get scared off at the notion that like monorepo, monolith, they both start with mono, hence they must mean the same thing. It must mean tightly coupled components and all the nastiness of monorepos, or of monoliths. But let's see, I'm doing it myself. It's, just, it's, it's a similar word. But that's it, uh, the actual uh, opposite intention of a monorepo. A monorepo is intended to be this big code base, but decoupled from each other in scope, but allowing everybody to work as a group and see and be a part of a culture. Uh, so, so that's the first thing I like to clear up is that a monolith is not a monorepo. Uh, that you can surely build a, a monolith that is a monorepo, but they are not the same thing. Um, so I like to clear that up. These are some of the hard things, I think, in a multi-repo setup. So there's kind of this, there's these two competing structures for, for repository setups. There's a monorepo, and then there's like kind of the multi-repo setup. So Corey talked about style guides earlier. And when I was at Lonely Planet years ago, we had a style guide called Rizzo. And Rizzo was in its own repo, and it was really, really good uh, component library. And it was built with Ruby and all the fun stuff and, and, and all kinds of cool things. It was actually featured on all kinds of, like it was like one of the top things you search for component style guides and you found it. One of the hardest things that I had to do was we had about 50 different Ruby apps that we had to try to bump that thing in. And trying to do that across 50 repos and keep Rizzo up to date was one of the most tedious and difficult things that I ever had to do. Because if you're talking about touching like a single line of CSS, you know, you had to go in Ruby bundle or gem bundle up the thing, go gem update and all the things. And even in a node app today, it's the same kind of process, right? If you change a single line of code or you fix a bug in a huge company where you have many, many teams across your organization, you're having to track all these people down and make sure they've got the latest patches and the latest security updates. And in a multi-repo setup, that's much, much difficult, much, much more difficult than it is in a monorepo. We'll get to why later. I think integra integration testing is another area that trying to do that across multiple repositories requires a huge tooling investment that's really complicated. Um, and sharing code has to be like in some sort of internal NPM registry or some kind of thing like that. So that's kind of really annoying. Um, and coordinating changes and rollouts at scale in a multi-repo setup is actually also very difficult. And so some of the reasons, I'm, I'm going to quantify some of the reasons in my experience why I just love working in a monorepo. The first one is atomic changes. And, and what does that mean? That means that in one commit, I can make changes across the entire ecosystem of my application. So if I introduce some new component or some breaking change to a component, 
because it's in a monorepo and I can get the dependency graph of the entire monorepo, I'm able to make the change or fix a bug in a component and see it go propagate throughout the entire system. Uh, and I can make one git commit to fix all those problems at the same time. Or if I have my back end code and my front end code together, I can change both the front end and the back end service at the same time. And that's a really cool thing. Uh, it gives you a nice clean history of all the things you've changed in your repo. So as like a, as, as a team, if you're like, if a bug came up and you're trying to track it down, you can see the exact commits that the front end and the back end changed at the same time. It's also nice for docs. You can update the documentation for your entire code base along with the components themselves. So that's very nice. Uh, and it allows to have consistent build tooling across projects. That's, I think, another one of the more complicated things to deal with in a multi-repository setup is you somehow have to build this like consistent set of tools to use across multiple repositories. And then again, you're having to go track down all the teams across your entire company that are using your tooling and make sure they're up to date. And particularly in today's world, I mean, UA Parser JS a few weeks ago and all these libraries that get hacked, you got to stay up to date on security updates and you got to get those guys patched and those teams ready to go. And so in a multi-repository setup, it's much more difficult to have that consistent build tooling. And it also fixes like context switching. You're not having to kind of bounce around different repositories. Again, it's easy to change across the entire platform. Another thing I really like is that our code reviews are, are centralized. So like we have one way to code review across all of the code base. And there's something really nice about that. Everyone's in the same place and, and you can set up rules that you know these five projects are owned by this team and then you can set up branch policies that say anytime this code changes, I need these people to get reviews on it. So you get your centralized code reviews. It's even easier to stand up new projects. I mean, everybody here has probably tried to create a new GitHub repository to start some new project, and then you remember, oh crap, I gotta get Babel, then I gotta get Jest, then I gotta get all this stuff. And I mean, you can kind of solve that problem with some of the generators and all that stuff. But in a multi-repo setup, you just create a new folder and all the tooling is just there and it just works. And that's really, really nice. And it allows you to just iterate quickly. And the same thing goes for updating shared code because you have this, these shared places in your monorepo that anybody can come and, and pull shared code from. I like to use the term blast radius testing because that's what I was talking about earlier. It's like if there's some component that I'm making an update to, I can see the blast radius of that change in my monorepo. If I make a quick CSS test or a quick CSS change that to me seems fairly insignificant, I can have a visual regression suite of tests across my monorepo that get that blast radius testing done we literally do this, by the way. <laughs> we make a change and we have visual regression testing that runs the apps and takes screenshots and does diffing and then I get a report back. And then I know immediately if I broke someone else's app and then I can go track that team down and say, hey guys, like, I'm sorry, I broke, I'm about to break your app. Like, can you help me figure out what's wrong? Uh, that's something that's really nice to be able to do in a monorepo. Code discoverability, obviously that's another thing. If everybody's in the same place, you can see everybody's code and try to find other useful utilities that some other team might have. Uh, that's very nice. Uh, you can have a single continuous integration system for pull requests and releases. Um, and I think there's a big cultural aspect of it as well. To me, when I was in a, a multi-repository setup at a, at a bigger company, it just created these silos where like you had, there was this team working over here on, on this set of tools and that team over there working on their set of tools. And as, as somebody who wants to like, sh to be a part of sharing and reusing people's code, like if they're built in different ways and they're constructed differently, it's just not as, it doesn't create this culture of, of sharing that I think working together in a monorepo uh, helps foster. And it brings people together and helps create this entire culture around working in one ecosystem together. Uh, and it helps create processes to help the monorepo evolve and change. So, you know, if some team is, is finding difficulty in one set, they can suggest changes that the entire ecosystem that uses it can be a part of and make everyone's lives better. And that's what we want. So the one thing I want to highlight here, though, is that similar to what Corey said in his talk about style guide and component libraries, this thing doesn't work unless it's funded because it's a lot of tooling. 
you have to have, a, I mean, really when you get to this kind of scale, you have to do that anyways, though. That's kind of the point that I want to make today. It's like, if you get to the point where you have 50 or 100 repositories, 300s, hundreds of repositories, you're going to end up having to write all this different tooling anyways, and some team's going to have to manage that. And all these things that I've already mentioned become tremendously easier when all of it is in a mo single monorepo and you have one team dedicated, or many, many teams. Uh, Office's monorepo has many teams that are working together on certain parts of the, of the monorepo, on the local developer experience, on the CI experience. And when that's all in a single place, it's just much easier to, to, to deal with. And in my slides, which I'll, I guess I didn't, but I'll tweet them later, uh, I have some interesting articles from uh, Google, Facebook, and Twitter. They're all three using monorepos and have been for a long time. Uh, so there's some good stuff going on there. So in any JavaScript ecosystem these days, there's a set of common shared tooling that I, that I like to highlight that, that any monorepo, really any repo has, but these are the kinds of toolings that, that a tooling team will need to maintain in a monorepo. It's like your package manager, your task runner, your compiler, your test runner, your bundler, and your publish step. And at the last job I had at Eventbrite, I had always tried to figure out how, to, there's like this thing in the front end world where um, your, the way you build code on your laptop or desktop mirrors what happens in uh, production. And, and, and it's the job of this monorepo team to manage all this tooling. And I loved this terminology that Microsoft uses uh, it's called the inner versus the outer loop, and I made this Venn diagram of the JavaScript ecosystem uh, version of that. So the inner loop is where uh, stuff that happens on your laptop, on localhost, and you've got things like your developer scripts, like running npm start, uh, and version control scripts. But then there's this weird overlap with JavaScript to me that I've always had a hard time explaining to, to people that do more back-endy heavy things. Like, you're going to have to npm install both locally and in CI. You're going to have to run Webpack locally and in CI. You're going to have to do all these things in the middle, and uh, it's just interesting to highlight that. And then there's things that happen only in the, the outer loop, which is the like your pipelines, your YAML, your Groovy files, your Jenkins files, all those things. Things like publishing 10 p.m. and security and localization. This is the kind of tooling that a good monorepo and a good monorepo team uh, has to manage and has to work with on a day-to-day -day basis. So that at the end of the day, the feature teams can just ship code, because that's what we want. Uh, the team that I'm on at Microsoft is called OneJS, and our just mandate is to just let people ship code as often as they can, as quickly as they can, and this is the set of tools that we, that we have to think about. In the JavaScript monorepo space, there's kind of like a framework versus tools sort of thing going on. You can have like a... Uh, an Angular or a React sort of thing. And so there's a lot of really good monorepo tools already in the ecosystem. Lerna, I think, was probably the most popular front-end re monorepo uh, project. And then the guy who created Lerna, Jamie Kyle, created Bolt, which is what I was using at Eventbrite. Rush is something that uh, is another Microsoft-owned uh, monorepo stack, but it's, it's on a different team, owned by a different team inside Microsoft. NX is really good. That kind of spun out of Angular. And uh, Turbo Repo is an up and coming one that uh, I'm trying to keep my eyes on too, because I think that thing is going to be pretty awesome. And then these last three are proof that like these big monorepo companies like Google and Facebook and Twitter have had to make their own things. And that's where the sort of pick your own adventure thing comes into play. And that's kind of where we're at on our 1JS team um, right now. But there's lots of ways you can kind of choose how you want to do things. Do you want to use jar npm or pnpm? Do you want to use gulp or grunt? If you're still using grunt, yeah, grunt. Grunt was the, like the best thing ever back then, man. God, it's so good. Uh, there's lots of lots of things you can do. So that's kind of some of the reasons why I personally love working on a re in a monorepo and why I'm on a team that is doing nothing but supporting the engineers in our monorepo. But I also am here to say it's not always rainbows and unicorns. There's a lot of difficult problems. And if you go Google uh, with Bing, obviously since I work at Microsoft, uh, for monorepo problems, you'll find some of these things. So kind of some of the top problems that I have found and that most people find are working at a huge monorepo are these things. Uh, version control, particularly, working with Git at scale. Parallelizing your, your runner, your tasking. Caching, hoisting, and versioning. 
And so I'm going to kind of break down, in my experience, what we've uh, dealt with and, and how we're fixing some of these problems. So obviously, in a monorepo, uh, particularly at like you know the Googles and Microsofts of the world, we have lots and lots and lots of code. And I mean lots, like literally billions of lines of code in some of these monorepos. And so Git just was not really fundamentally ready to support that much code. So we've had to fix it. Uh, it Git commands became really slow. It's super hard to navigate the project. Uh, you have slow clones. And Microsoft invested a lot of time into uh, this tool, originally called Git Virtual File System, and now uh, something called Scalar. And there's this really good blog post on what Scalar is there that I have linked. And Scalar has now actually been merged into Microsoft's fork of Git. And we have a fork of Git, yes, because we had to. And that's what we use mostly internally. But it's really actually, you can go, this is all open source stuff that you can go see. And you can actually use the Microsoft Git uh, and get some of these benefits uh, in the open source world. Some of the cool things that I like to highlight that uh, the, the Scalar work now in Git can do, you can do a partial clone which basically means you can clone the bare minimum of the repository and then specifically pull down Git objects that you need. You can also do background prefetching, which basically means Git is, is, is checking uh, all the time for new stuff and pulling it down on demand or like as you need it rather than like on the first clone. Sparse checkout is probably one of the coolest things you can do now. And this is all Git native stuff. I think Sparse checkout is actually even Git native now but definitely in our, in our Microsoft Git. Sparse checkout means if I'm a developer who only cares about 10 projects, you can actually get sparse checkout those 10 projects instead of having to check out the entire monorepo. And that's amazing. That's very helpful. Uh, the, and all of this works by this cool file system monitor that uh, eliminates the need for Git to scan your entire working tree all the time. That's kind of how fundamentally Scalar works. Uh, and then there's some other cool stuff uh, committing, with the commit graph, some indexing things. I don't even, those are, I copied some of that from the readme. So my favorite ones are those first four. But it does even more. It's crazy how much it does. So we, we, we solved that problem. Git, Git was not working. And we worked really hard. And we have got, got a solution for Git now. And that is uh, Scalar and now in the Microsoft Git fork. So really cool stuff. I highly recommend you checking it out. There's some great articles. Uh, by Derek Stoley, who talks about all that stuff on the uh, GitHub blog. Yeah, I mean, you can, that stuff all works locally, too. You can, you can sparse checkout just on your machine and just only check out that stuff locally. Is that what you mean? Oh, oh, oh. There is, well, GitHub itself has some tools now for that. I forget off the top of my head what it is. I mean, obviously, you have to, that always means you have to rewrite history. There's really no way around that still. But, uh, but I'm trying to remember the git rewrite thing. There is a th there is, GitHub has a tool for that now as well. I'm trying to remember what it was. It's like a Python thing. Um, good, good question. Another hard problem that you have to overcome is dealing with uh, parallelizing your tasks. Because when you're working with you know, hundreds of packages, you need them to build. And uh, there's a couple different ways you can go about doing that. The first and most obvious and easy one is to use NPM or Yarn workspaces and use Run. But that gets you to a certain place. Uh, then you can step into using Lerna. And Lerna has a, a Lerna Run task that's pretty good also and does a topological graph. Uh, but what we're using at, at Microsoft now is this tool called Laga. Uh, and Laga has this ability to create a task graph of your entire dependency tree and say, OK, so you've got these packages. These ones depend on this package. And it'll run them all in this topological order and make sure that if like package A has a dependency on B, then B gets built first, and then A gets built. And Lerna can do that too. But what's interesting, and I'll show a picture of it on the next slide, is that uh, we've built Laga in such a way that you don't have to run like logger run build, and then logger run test, and then logger run this. You can actually run logger run build lint test, and it'll create this graph, and it'll split it out across all the CPUs on your machine. And as soon as like the build tasks are all starting to get done, it'll automatically start moving to the to the next step. 
to the lint step or the test step, and it does it, you can do them all at once. And as soon as CPUs are available, it starts picking up the next task to run. And that's really nice, especially in CI, because you're, you're harnessing the entire machine. We were able to start using some bigger Azure boxes with more CPUs and cut our build times down tremendously with this technology. So that's one thing you kind of have to do. As well as using something like a, like a synth flag, in Logo particularly, you can use a synth flag, which basically gets a git diff of your project and converts it into package names. So you're like, I don't want to build the whole thing all the time. I only want to build what changed. And so that's really important for whatever task runner you're using to be able to do that. And so this uh, is, is a picture of what I'm talking about where you can kind of see it over there. But basically, as soon as one task is done, the CPU will start picking up another task. And this is, this is one also awesome feature of Logo, by the way. Uh, it dumps out this profile that you can open in the Chrome developer tools. And each one of those lines is, represents a CPU. And it shows you exactly which task it ran on each CPU. And you can see the entire dependency graph get built. It's really awesome and super helpful for debugging. But even this has its limitations. Because at some point or another, when you get to a certain scale, you've got to start distributing your stuff across computers. Because one vertical scaling can only go so far. You know, 64 CPUs, whew, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of processing. That's what we're at right now. But then you get to a certain point when you have to start distributing. And Microsoft has built a technology for us called Build Excel. And this is sort of similar to Basil at Google, uh, where it can do all this parallelism now. So now we can start taking that same log of dependency graph that we have and actually splitting it up across multiple machines in the cloud and doing all that work at scale and spinning it up on a bazillions, literally, of machines that we have available and doing that work that way as well. Uh, so that's a really powerful thing that you'll get into as well. Build Excel works out of the box. And again, this is another open source tool that we have. It works with Lerna, with Yarn, with Rush, and uh, there's, there's a thing called front ends, and these are all links you can check out. And it has incremental builds as well, because it does really, really aggressive caching. Uh, and it'll cache your file system state as well as previous builds. And it'll push all those caches to the cloud. And um, what's really amazing about that is, rather than having to like, figure out what changed through Git disk and like, only build those things, Build Excel is so good that it just builds everything every time, no matter how big your repo is, but it pulls like 98% of it from Azure blob storage down in like just a matter of seconds, and only actually gives you the things in your PR that you, or builds the things in your PR that have, that have changed, but basically by leveraging distributed caching. Um, we'll talk about caching more in a minute as well. The other thing that both tools like Build Excel and, um, Basil do from Google is they guarantee input and output strictness to this term called sandboxing. And it basically makes sure that like package A can't reach into package B without strictly declaring its inputs and outputs and its dependency graph. And that's really very important at a, in a huge monorepo to ensure that you have consistency in how things are being built. So definitely check out Build Excel as well. It's a really powerful open source tool that we have as well. The next really important thing is uh, caching. That's what I just mentioned. So it, it, invariably, at some point, you're going to be doing just dozens of builds of all of these packages. And we've got 1,000 that we're dealing with right now and probably thousands more that we're going to be adding to our monorepo. So it's really important to have a shared CI cache for your workers to be able to just pull things down off of. And so with Build Excel and actually with Laga, uh, Laga also has caching built in. Um, you, it will cache every step of the build graph for you in a Azure storage or wherever storage. I mean, I say Azure because that's obviously what we're using, but somewhere in a blob storage of choice. Uh, so that way, you know, you're not repeating stuff in every CI build. I know at Eventbrite when I was there, I was constantly rebuilding stuff that I was like, I know I don't even need to rebuild this, but I have to because like there's no way for me to figure out how to pull that from a cache. And some of the, a lot of this is built in. To our, to our task runner, Laga, uh, through this tool called Backfill, uh, another open source tool. And Backfill will literally, as soon as a Laga uh, task is done, as soon as like, it runs a, a, a build script or a test script, it'll cache those results in Azure. 
and then if for some reason that PR fails, you know, through a test failing or something, the next run of that will pull most of that, uh, that work down off of the cache. So then I don't have to worry about like rebuilding certain things that I know worked last time. And that's really nice and makes CI much faster. And this premise to me is something that we're getting into now. We're not quite there, but if you imagine as a developer in the front end code where uh, you have a project on your, on your local computer and that project takes on lots of other dependencies that you don't necessarily want to build. You only care about your one package. What we're getting close to be doing with Build Excel is you can basically build one thing and then pull the rest off of that CI cache. Because since it's cache based on the file contents, you can just go grab those caches from the cloud and pull them down to your local machine. And then you're literally only building the one app or whatever it is you're working with. And you have like this, and you have the cloud at your disposal to help your local builds work faster too. So not only are you getting the, the benefits of a faster CI, but you're also going to have this caching available on your local developer boxes so that you don't have to run Webpack 900,000 times a day. So that's a really nice advantage of this caching thing. So caching is huge and a big monitor though. Gotta, gotta love caching. One of the other uh, annoying problems with working particularly in a JavaScript monorepo is um, dealing with nodes hoisting. So if you don't know what hoisting is in JavaScript or in Node particularly, uh, we'll talk about it here in just a second. But um, basically, it's very annoying. <laughs> and let's explain why. There's two major issues that, uh, that hoisting can cause in a monorepo uh, out of the box. Uh, phantom dependencies and doppelgangers, and these are documented on Russia's website. You can go check them out, but we'll talk about them uh, right now. So with node module resolution, it's a default node behavior that when you are requiring React, that's really small, I think, but uh, basically, if, you, if, a, if a package asks for React, what's going to happen is it's going to look at the closest node modules directory first, right? And then it's going to say, is React there? Uh, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but then it's going to go to the packages slash node modules, then it's go to the node modules, and it'll recurse and do this all the way through your file system, looking around and around and around for React until it gets all the way to the slash. Okay, we kind of probably all knew that, but why is that a problem? Well, here's why it's a problem. Because in a monorepo, if you have a packages directory where you have all these things living next to each other, if you have one package that takes a dependency on React, and another that doesn't, the default hoisting algorithm of NPM is going to hoist that package up to the monorepo's root. And that means that if I have a package like this colors one that forgot to take a dependency on React, then the colors package can actually use React. And that could be really bad, because what if somebody expect, what if that, what if that colors package actually needed React 16.9 and 16.13, or 16.13, and React 16.9 got hosted. The colors package is going to break because it doesn't have hooks or some feature. Or similarly for like Webpack, if they were depending on Webpack 5, but Webpack 4 got hoisted, then your build's going to fail. And so node module resolution will uh, find a way to, to do that. And my slide thing just went crazy. There we go. It will find a way to find the right package. Um, there are some, I think I th that was sort of a, a, a quick overview of both phantom dependencies and doppelgangers at the same time. The phantom one is like finding a package that uh, wasn't there, and then the doppelgangers one is like you, you think you're using the right version of React, but you're not. And both of those problems can cause huge issues in a build system uh, where you're trying to build everything with Webpack. So here's some solutions to that in a big monorepo. Uh, there's, a, there's a really good NPM module called depth check. And this thing uses what's called ASTs. And I don't know if you know what ASTs are, but that stands for abstract syntax trees. And that thing will, it's basically how Webpack works as well. It will literally read your code and break it down into tokens and then allow you to manipulate that code. It's how Babel works, how Webpack works. And DevCheck is really good because it will say, all right, this person imported React, but it's not in their package JSON. And so that's one pretty good way to catch it. But there's a lot of different kinds of packages, particularly we find with the TypeScript at types packages where no one imports at types. You know, they're just sort of implicitly there by your build system. So those ones cause us real big headaches. 
uh, not to mention things like Jest, which just, you know, or TS Jest that just kind of are, are added in the tooling layer. And so there's no dependencies like in the package JSON necessarily on those, or, or in the code rather. So you can't just rely on scanning code for those. So that doesn't really work. Um, so uh, what we have been working on, and this is really cool, um, when we first started off on 1.js, uh, we were using Yarn, because Yarn's great, it really was. I wasn't a, it was, anyway, it's fine, it's really good. Uh, but there were some performance issues that even we ran into with Yarn once it hit a certain mass. Uh, and we went in and created a fork of Yarn to go in and, and make, some depend, uh, make some performance upgrades, particularly around network concurrency, because uh, we were like sending so many requests at once to NPM, it was just dying. So we put some logic in there to fix some things. And then there was some just basic code things we went and fixed. And we're like, cool, we're gonna send all that back into Yarn. And this was right when Yarn v1 was getting into uh, moving to Yarn v2. And Arcanist, who runs Yarn, was like, hey, uh, we're not taking any more contributions to Yarn 1. And we're like, oh, well, that's good. So now we're stuck with a fork of Yarn. <laughs> That's no good, but it's fine. We've been maintaining our own fork of yarn, and this is actually on NPM. It's called Midgard Yarn, and it's much faster than regular yarn uh, because of some of the upgrades that we did. And it's available. It, lots of teams inside Microsoft are using Midgard Yarn now, and anyone here could use Midgard Yarn. Uh, so that was sort of step one. Uh, that didn't solve the strictness problems that helped with performance. The strictness things came because we were investigating tools like PNPM and Rush. And uh, the idea of PNPM, if you've never heard of it, which we'll get to in a minute, um, fixes a lot of these problems. Uh, and so we, we took some of the work of Midgard Yarn and created this thing called Midgard Yarn Strict. And strict being the word here where we're saying you're gonna have to declare your dependencies. You know, where you're gonna break if you don't declare your dependencies. Um, and also, if you've never used PNPM, it's, it's this other, you know, another package manager -y thing. And, um, not only does it solve some of these dependency hoisting issues I mentioned, but it also solves really, really good performance problems because uh, what PNPM does in its install process is rather than creating this flat node modules folder at the root of your project and then you know having dozens of other node modules folders throughout your project and potentially duplicating multiple versions of React, because if you have two different versions of React required in your project, it's gonna hoist one version to the top, and then all the rest of the Reacts that you have are gonna be copied. So if you have like 10 projects that required React 16.9 and another 30 that required 16.13, the 16.9 one will go into the root of your project, but the rest of the 16.13 will be duplicated in your file system, causing massive bloat, which is why Yarn is so slow, right? Because it's like literally having to download and put React in like 50 different folders on your, in your project. Uh, and so what the install process of PNPM does is it actually has a store that it downloads everything into and then it sim links into the projects. And so this is much, much, much faster and on top of a, a lot of other things that it does. Uh, we weren't quite ready to go straight into P using PNPM though for a handful of other reasons. So. Um, this guy Vincent, who I work with from our OZO office, worked on uh, Midgard Yarn Strict. And Midgard Yarn Strict creates this local store and does all this sim linking. And again, adds, uh, it takes away a lot of the duplication, it's much faster. Uh, and because of the fact that we put that store folder outside of the node modules directory, that hoisting model doesn't work anymore. So nobody can just accidentally grab a version of React because hoisting doesn't work anymore <laughs> because we have installed those node modules in a separate directory so you can't accidentally grab something you didn't mean to grab. Um, this is where this gets even more awesome to me. Uh, so Vincent did all this work for a year and a half and I've been helping him implement it in our project but we have actually been working together on an RFC to put this work directly into the NPM CLI in a new mode, a new opt-in installation mode called isolated mode. And we've been working with them to land those changes. And that is where like, I was like, that's cool. I'm really excited about that part. Uh, Cause I'm getting to actually help contribute to make everyone's lives better. Not just what I'm doing inside Microsoft on my one JS team. Like we're going and making this better for the entire JavaScript ecosystem, which is like why I'm 
excited to be what I'm doing. Yes, thank you. <laughs> it's really fun. Uh, so here's just a couple of quick screenshots. I ran these a few minutes ago. Uh, again, these are kind of small, I'm sorry. But uh, basically, in a small project I had, I ran yarn with no cache in a minute. I ran Midgard Yarn Strict, that saved 44 seconds, or it went down to 46 seconds, so it saved 15 just there. But the other cool thing that uh, Midgard Yarn Strict and what we're working on uh, for NPM is gonna do is, we found that with yarn, um, if you're not, if you haven't taken a, a coding uh, interview in a long time, you may not remember a lot of this, but uh, there's this concept of linear ON time and logarithmic time complexities. And we were finding that yarn basically was growing, the install times of yarn were growing linearly with how big our monorepo got, which was obviously like really bad because we have a lot of projects in there and we're adding more and more and more by the day. And so what we found after we implemented this PNPM-like strategy is that we've now gone sublinear with the way that we're able to scale in our monorepo. So we could add thousands of more packages, but because of how this isolated mode and our Midgard Yarn Strict is working, uh, it's gone flat. So basically the time of installing with Yarn is not increasing linearly anymore, which is incredible and was one of the biggest objectives we had for all of this work. Uh, because we're, you know, installing a lot of stuff. Node modules is a lot. Um, and this is a screenshot of what it actually looks like on disk. So again, you've got this like node modules folder here with the dot store, but then everything in your, in your individual packages is symlinked back to that store. And so that's how the entire PNPM process works. And this is a screenshot here of the closed RFC. So that's, this was uh, about maybe a month ago, I think, that we got the RFC closed. Um, and by the way, there is always every Wednesday a public NPM RFC meeting that anyone can join. Uh, and so I was on there a couple weeks ago helping Vincent with this. I can't take a ton of credit for the, I'm helping share the good works here. My friend Vincent here has, has done a lot of this work. I've been helping him implement it in our code base. But uh, yeah, definitely give Vincent some thanks for that. So uh, I'm really excited about that. Keep an eye on that project. Uh, there was a bunch of comments on that RFC thread, uh, some really good examples of how it's gonna help. Um, I think of all the things that I've talked about today, this is the one I'm most proud of because you know your package manager is sort of fundamental to making the whole thing work for you in a monorepo, at least in the JavaScript world. Um, and usually that's the longest step of the process, both locally and in CI. And something I'm just not popping into my head that I realized I didn't mention is that Midgard Yarn Strict also will support installing subsets of your dependency tree as well. So part of the, again, the slow part in a monorepo is like running yarn when you first clone the thing down and it has to install 150,000 node modules. But with the work we're doing, you're gonna actually be able to say like uh, yarn or Midgard Yarn Strict install and give it a package name and it'll figure out that package's dependency graph and only install the dependencies of that thing. So if you combine that with like the ability to only get sparse checkout a certain project, you could imagine a world where you could get checkout like a few folders and then only NPM install those few things. And so even though you're in a code base with literally millions of lines of code, you have no idea because all the tooling just works like you were only working on those 10 things. And that's kind of the stuff that we're working on here. So that's isolated mode. I'm really excited about isolated mode. Uh, versioning is another one that's really difficult in a monorepo. And uh, our solution for that, there's, there's lots of them out there. Um, Semver obviously is the, is the way we, sem we version things. Uh, there's two tools in particular that I want to call out that if you're trying to work in a monorepo and you're like, man, just trying to version all these packages is really difficult. Uh, Learn obviously has it built in, uh, but we're using something called Beach Ball. Uh, there's also something called Change Sets. And what this lets you do is rather than, you know, in a big monorepo having to worry about, you know, you've got a thousand packages and dependency trees and I need to make a change to this package, so I got to go update the package JSON and go find everywhere else that's using that package and update their versions and then create change logs. These sets of tools will do that automatically. Uh, and they usually do that in the case of Beach Ball. It basically writes a JSON file that describes like the git commit and what you're changing uh, and it puts those on disk. And then when you say Beach Ball publish, it'll read all those change files and then go in and just shoop, 
read the dependency tree of all the things you're changing, update a bunch of package JSONs for you, and then you can uh, generate some change logs and then move on with your life. And it's much easier than trying to hand do all that stuff. So um, check out Beach Ball or Change Sets. Change Sets is made by Atlassian. Beach Ball is another thing that uh, we're helping maintain. So definitely take a look at those. Uh, a bonus problem that I wanted to make sure we were brought up is um, ownership. Obviously, in a, in a huge monorepo like this, you've got uh, a lot of players in, in the game, um, and you don't <laughs> realize how that is very complicated, uh, dealing with people and dealing with that many people. So it's really important, especially for my team designing and, and maintaining these tools, for us to build consensus um, and to try to help, like again, I mentioned earlier, around the pull request process, you know, making sure that you have some way to say, you know, these 10 packages are owned by this team and these 10 packages are owned by that team. That's huge. Um, but I think, honestly, above all, the, the thing I'd say is just communicating is, is huge. Uh, making sure that you're staying in contact with your developers and making sure that they're happy um, and having that engineering system team to help maintain that stack. Um, and we've actually been able to also put in place this really nice process where every change that I want to make to the monorepo, the first step I do is I go write an RFC for my own monorepo. Like, and I put this process in place for myself because what I wanted to do is, is, is have a dedicated way to change my monorepo but make sure there was buy-in and visibility onto the process from everyone in, in there. Uh, so we have weekly RFC meetings where me and uh, my friend Benjamin get together and we read the new RFCs and we usually have about 20 or 30 people that come in and just like make sure that everything seems good on their end and that the RFC looks good and then we start to do work. And I also love that meeting because it, it again, it's this culture of collaboration and, and the entire ecosystem of, of our monorepo is getting to see the thing change and have an opinion and, and say, oh yeah, I, that's a great RFC. I actually had a similar idea. Like, have you thought about doing it like this? And then that helps me as like the maintainer of this thing to make sure that I'm putting good effort into developing good requirements and making sure that everyone's getting all the goodness that they could possibly get. Because at the end of the day, my job every day at Microsoft is to uh, make sure that everyone else's day goes really well. Because there's nothing worse than a bad developer experience as developers, am I right? So you, know, you don't want to wake up and, and hate what you have to do every day. So that's kind of what we do. So in conclusion, uh, modern repos uh, are very hard, but uh, I think tooling makes them less hard. And that tooling is hard, but having a tooling team makes it less hard as well. And the cool thing is, is everything I've described is working in a monorepo of about five million lines of code. The Office one is even bigger than that, like, which is a whole different team. I'm missing the, the JavaScript one. Um, but the thing is, like, if you go look around the JavaScript ecosystem, Babel is in a monorepo. You know, there's lots of tooling in our ecosystem that are built in monorepos. And even if you only have 100 packages or even 50 packages, this tooling, some of the stuff, again, out of the box, like Lerna, Rush, NX, look into using those things. I think you'll, you'll be really surprised at how easy they are and how um, they can change your company's culture into this just nice place for everyone to work together in harmony. Uh, so, yeah, definitely take a look at it. It's not something that, uh, you know, the hard parts come once you get into the, like, hundreds of thousands and millions of lines of code. Like, if you're at a company that's got you know, tens of thousands of code, just look into stuff like Learn and NX and give it a shot, and I think you'll really, really enjoy using it. The last thing I have to mention is uh, a few, like last year or a year before that, um, <laughs> I am a front-end developer. I've been doing front-end development for, you know, most of my life now, like six or seven years, but in the last, like, five, I took this weird shift out of writing React components like Cory does into, like, maintaining JavaScript tooling. And it was kind of fun because I was like talking to the JavaScript community and I tweeted and I was like, what even am I? I call myself a front-end developer, but I never write JavaScript. I write like TypeScript to build scripts. I write Docker files. I write YAML. I write like, I work on CI systems. 
And uh, so we sort of got together and I asked some people and then we came up with this coin, this term called DevOps. So D I did like, like DevOps instead of DevOps. Uh -huh, it's very funny, but it's actually been really fun uh, because these problems that I'm solving are some of them unsolved or some of them are solved in different ways at different companies. And I wanna come together as a community because this stuff is hard. And uh, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, you know, go to that link or come talk to me because I wanna make the JavaScript ecosystem better, not only for the people I'm serving at Microsoft, but for everyone. Because like, you know, every day something new is changing and there's a new way to do things. But if we keep doing this thing in silos, again, these, these silos that we've created, you know, Lyft is doing it this way, Facebook's doing it that way, Microsoft's doing it this way. If we all kind of just work together, I bet we could do some pretty cool stuff together. So that's kind of the spirit behind that community that I wanted to make sure I mentioned. Um, so yeah, that's it. That's modern repos. Thank you. you can, again, come up, ask questions. Um, Jay Kareem or 898 on literally every social network that there is in existence. And uh, and so we can talk. Thanks. You can you can come on or whatever. Yeah, you can ask questions from there. Yeah, um, a lot of interesting stuff. Love to talk about. I'm curious though about the use case for like having a whole lot of stuff in one repo. Like, mm -hmm. I'm just having trouble picturing that. Like, sure. No. Right. Yeah, that's a great question. So, the premise of it is like there may be one big project in there, like if you can imagine that one of the big clients that I'm supporting is like the Office Online suite. So like Word in your browser, and that's comprised of dozens of different teams, right? And so uh, each one of those teams was in its own repo before, and it was really hard for them to communicate updates and get things, and it's tr especially trying to like do bundling and all these like upgrades and doing all these things. And so by coming together and being in one place, they've been able to coordinate that way better. So this works uh, in that kind of a sense. So it works best, I think, when you have you know certain boundaries drawn up. Uh, but even if you don't, it doesn't matter because of the stuff that I've described here is like, you now, even if you're not a part of the big thing, even if you are just like a, a, a team that maybe only supports five folders out of the 10,000 monorepo folders, you still get all the other tooling benefits of being in there. And because of the way that we're building this stuff, if, even if you only own five things, it's not gonna slow you down because we've built all this other stuff around it. So it really helps when you are on a team where you're you know, a part of this big application or whatever. Um, but it, you still get the benefits of being in the modern repo. You don't have to worry about, you know, you can imagine a, a company our size, you've got to do all this security checking and component governance and all these crazy things. And by coming into the modern repo, you just get that out of the box. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Because again, at the end of the day, the goal is just to let the teams who are shipping code to customers do that as quickly and efficiently as they can, because that's what matters anyway. So that's kind of the main benefit, I think. Uh, I don't know if you're going to be able to share this or not. It's kind of trivia, but it's always interesting to know how other teams work. Uh -huh. How long does the build take? And what is a reasonable time? Like, what is your target for sure. getting the whole build out? Yeah, so um, the office monorepo is, is different, but ours, our PRs take anywhere from 40 minutes to maybe an hour. The, uh, uh, the In one of our tenants, the other tenant takes a lot longer because they're doing um, blocking visual regression testing as well, so that one I think takes like three hours, but we're, that one's debatable whether or not, we're trying to get that one down to about 40 as well. And actually our goal, and part of our goal in the next few quarters is to get it down to under 30 minutes. Uh, so, and, and that's what we're gonna be investing in like tools like ES Build or whatever, Webpack Module Federation and all those different things to get that down even faster. And in the stuff I was talking about with NPM isolated mode, where you'll be able to install all your packages really quickly as well. Uh, so all of that's coming as well. Um, a lot of this is new for, uh, for me and for us, uh, I mean, literally in the last year and a half. Um, so I'd say 45 minutes is, is a good place to start. <laughs> and we're only gonna get faster from there, even inside of this ginormous monorepo. Uh, and the caching and all that stuff is where that helps. So good question. Anyone else? In here, sweet. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Come talk. I love JavaScript tooling.